fantastic. That's really That's great. Um, and just so you know, this meeting is being recorded, this meetup group uh, of Virtual Agile. So welcome aboard uh, the Virtual Agile uh, meetup group. We are here tonight with four guests, which is amazing. We're super excited about that. Um, I will introduce you um, to our guests very shortly and they will introduce themselves and all of that good stuff. Um, so, uh, thank you again for coming tonight. Um, it's really lovely, whatever time zone you're in, um, just to spend the next sort of uh, 90 minutes with us. This is our time box for this evening. Uh, as you know, we've got some uh, groupies out there, I can see, and also some new faces as well. So uh, it is very interactive uh, group, this virtual meetup. Everybody is usually friendly. I'm not going to put any um, guarantees on that, but generally we are a friendly bunch. We, uh, as, as, as uh, Ines just pressed the recording button, we love, the reason we have this um, is for many reasons really, but um, it's always good to share uh, knowledge with the wider community. Um, so we do do that and you'll be able to see our playlist um, on YouTube that we will share with you guys afterwards as well. Um, Use, utilize the chat, Zoom chat, um, put your questions in there. Uh, I mean, I will leave it up to the guests, but uh, usually we have quite, you know, put your hands up, speak out, put your questions in, do whatever makes you feel comfortable, really. Um, so very quickly on why we set up Virtual Agile. Innes and I basically uh, were getting quite a few questions of how are you still doing what you're doing as Scrum Masters and Agile Coaches um, when we're all remote and we were like well why don't we set up a group and try and help other people so we can share the knowledge like I was saying before. Um, Innes, I will, would you like to just introduce yourself as a co-host person? Sure. Hello, I'm Ines Garcia from Barcelona, living in London uh, for uh, 14 years now because life takes you to an interesting path. Uh, I'm an agile coach, Salesforce so MVP, and I invent stuff for a living. And today I'm your host. Thank you very much, Ines. Right, so in the usual format, we've got a bit of a warm up game. We uh, don't use our hands enough on our day-to-day -day basis. And as you know, I am a huge fan of rock, paper, scissors. And if you don't know this already, then welcome to my world of rock, paper, scissors. So firstly, everybody know what rock, paper, scissors is? Have you, oh, yes. For those who've been there before, excellent. Um, so I'm going to ask you three questions and you will answer in the form of rock, paper, scissors. So we have rock. Can I see your best rock? Beautiful, really, really nice. Strong rock there, John, strong rock. And uh, paper, your best paper. Ooh, some floaty papers, lovely, beautiful. And what about a pair of scissors? And depending on your day, I go for this rather than this. Okay, fantastic, lovely, beautiful. Right, so are we all ready? When I ask the question, you then show whether you are a rock, paper, scissor. A rock is a yes, a paper is a not sure, and a scissor is a no, we wanna cut it out. So firstly, hopefully an easy one. Are you excited to be here tonight? Yay, we did have one scissor once, so we were all very confused. He said, you're not locked into the Zoom call, you can leave at any time. Okay, so my second question is, is it important to bring happiness to the teams that you work with? Cool, a unilateral, yes, rocks, excellent. And do you experience obstacles when helping organizations to become more agile? Oh, so many rocks. Okay, excellent. We're all experiencing the same pain points or the same, um, experience, uh, same experiences as we do together on a day-to-day -day basis. So on this note then, I will uh, just introduce some of our guests then. So we have Jonathan Smart, who has come to join us tonight. And we also have uh, uh, Zolt, 
Ferenz, I'm really sorry, I'm terrible at saying any kind of name. Um, thank you, Zolt, for your That's perfect. Perfect. forgiveness. Okay, thank you. Uh, Miles o o Oglevy. Oglevy. Ogilvy, thank you. Thank you very uh, much. Yeah. And Simon Roher. Right. Do we have Simon? Close enough. That's thank close you. Enough. Yeah, I should have practiced this beforehand. I'm so sorry, but thank you so much. So the guys have come to join us tonight. Um, they wrote a wonderful book uh, called Sooner, Safer, Happier about anti-patterns and patterns and all of this good stuff. And Innes is showing that in the corner there. So thank you very much. So I, what I'll do is I'll hand over to you guys now to take the floor and stop. Great. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and thanks, thanks for attending. For those of you that have, that have attended, thanks for having us. Um, hi, hi, John McElroy. It's been a long time. Uh, Tory, I don't know if it, that's the Tory that is that the Tory that I know. Tory, I'm not sure because your camera's off. Um, if it is, hello. Um, and so, Miles, do you want to share your screen? Yep. So, a bit about me. Um, I help organizations improve their ways of working to get better business outcomes. The lead author of Sooner Safer Happier, previously head of ways of working at Barclays Bank and an agile and lean practitioner since the early 1990s. Thanks, and I'm Miles Ogilvy. I've I come up through the program and project route. I was for a long time at Barclays, uh, 13 years, uh, leading ways of working for the investment bank in the last few years of that. And I'm now a business agility coach and uh, trainer. Hi, I'm Simon Rora. Um, I am a software developer. That's what I identify as. Um, I've been doing Agile and Lean for just a little less long than John. I picked up the Extreme Programming White Book in 1999. I have never looked back. Uh, these days, I'm in Copenhagen. This is my Brexit escape. Um, I work for Saxa Bank as uh, head of enterprise technology architecture and ways of working. Thanks. Scott? Hello, my name is Joel Berend, and I'm a business agility coach, practitioner, and trainer. Um, it's 16 years plus experience. Uh, worked at Barclays uh, for a number of years, currently at Nationwide as a product owner and as a business agility coach. It's me. So what we're going to do is I think we're going to start with a mentee survey. We're going to find out a little bit about you and your context, what's working well, what your challenges are, and then we'll share the top eight patterns and anti-patterns which correspond to the book. So, Miles, over to you. Sure, thanks. So if you could hold up your device, whatever is for hands, uh, against the QR code or go to mentee.com and type in that code, uh, that will get you into the survey. And I will just flick over the screen. You don't need to memorize the code because it'll be visible on the screen anyway if you haven't got it by the time I change screens. What you should see when you go to that code as um, I'm seeing you come in here, there's a little number as you come in, is um, who would you rather have lunch with? Uh, the code, if you didn't get it, it's written at the top of the screen here still. So it's menti.com and that code. Uh, just a bit of fun to get everyone into the tool while we start seeing um, the, uh, so oh, someone wants the queen, that's nice to see. Uh, Boris not doing so well today. Eight, nine of us in. I think that's probably most of us. Oh, Boris, not, Boris not doing Great. so well today on the survey or just in general? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no comments. Um, okay. So, first proper question, then. Thank you for that. And the question is, is why? And why at your organization or in an organization you're, you've recently been working at, is, is there a wise ways of working happening? Is there a clear articulation of, of why change is necessary in that organization in your context where you're currently or, or were recently working? Is, it, is there a clear articulation? And um, secondly, are colleagues engaged on that conversation? So is, it, is, it, is there a conversation going on? Is it clear to everybody why that change matters. And thirdly, is there a description of the, out, the outcomes? Is there an articulation of what are the outcomes resulting from that change the organization is actually seeking? 
Are those outcomes being measured and made transparent? And then the last one, which is kind of flips around the other way on the scale, is it agile for agile's sake or DevOps for DevOps sake or cloud for cloud sake or digital for digital sake? Is it something happening without, a, without other reasons why? I'm gonna keep the results hidden so we've got a few more people through those questions. Okay, I think that's pretty much everyone through of a reveal. Jolt, over to you. Thank you. So the first one is um, just based on the shape is skewed towards the light. Uh, so it sounds like um, in your experience, it's more uh, towards the right. So there is a clear articulation of the why. It's really good to see. Um, calling engagement on why. So again, it's more, more in the middle. Um, as a number is towards the left, so it's not so much as the previous one. Clear application of desired business outcomes, similar shape, so less than less than three, um, and measuring those outcomes. So yes, it's 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 more towards definitely more towards the left. So we are not measuring outcomes, we're not making it transparent. So that's what we usually see. It's non-trivial. It's pretty hard actually. And uh, agile for agile's sake, um, so it is not for agile for agile's sake. It's awesome to see, or at least more towards the left. Great, thank you. Cool. So next question then coming up, and this is um, how change is being approached in that organisation where you're working at. Is it a top-down perspective, inflict over invite? with the change that's needed determined by the highest paid person's opinion? Is it a one size fits all approach to change? Everyone needs to do it the same way. Is perhaps the organization doing agile, trying to do it right, as opposed to exhibit agility? And is change being managed as a transformation project with an end date? We see that quite often. And finally, is the change scaling framework or tooling led, but in either case, not, not being led as a cultural change activity? Just going to leave that for a few minutes for the results to come in. Okay, I'm going to reveal now. There's a couple of you still not quite there, but we'll move it on. Jolt, over to you. Yeah, so it's <clears throat> yeah, it's 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 inflict over invite. Uh, it's more towards the the right, so it's not good to see. Um, you see a lot of inflict and not so much of invite. One size fits all, not so much. That's good. So although although it's skewed towards the, the shape towards the right, it's still in the middle. Um, doing agile over exhibiting agility. So in your experience, it's, it's more of that. So more of the doing and not so much of um, the benefits and the long lasting impacts um, of that. So, and transformation project with an end date. No, not at all. That's really good to see. So it's a definite no. And scaling framework uh, or tooling led. Again, again, just based on the last vote came in, <laughs> it's more scaling framework lad, so um, that's not good to see. That's that's what that's what we usually see there. So thank you. Great, wonderful, thank you. What a great audience you are. Really um, thinking well. So final um, piece here. So what is working well in your context in that organisation? What challenges are you facing? And what's what's um, and what's working well. If you have a challenge, could you start that with AP, the letters A and the letters P, and then write a few words saying what the challenges are that you're facing. Just, you can enter as many times as you want. So you type AP and then something. If you wanna say something that's working well, say you're getting really good support from whatever department or from whatever function or any particular patterns, start with a P and say something that's working well. You can enter as many patterns as you want as well. So AP or P, just to differentiate. 
Beautiful. So anti-pattern, a lack of support from leadership. Very common. We see that in many, many organizations. Another uh, anti clarity, pattern, I think, here. Yeah, yeah. In, in competent coaching, that's awesome. So it's, yeah, actually <clears throat> damage instead of helping the organization. We've seen this happening. Um, Command and control management. So there is a team around leadership here. So command and control as an anti-pattern. Grassroots support. That's awesome. So it's the bottom up that teams are doing agility, or practicing agility. You all must do agile and be agile. Again, it's just um, for capital A, uh, capital T. Uh, agile transformation instead of focusing on outcomes. That's an anti-pattern. Mini waterfalls, yeah, mini, mini waterfalls. It could be, um, if that's the only option, it's, um, it's then it, it, it could become a, the last option actually to, to make it smaller. Having perfect analysis before development. Yeah, that's an anti-pattern. So big upfront design, big upfront um, architecture, big upfront planning. And no focus on outcomes, so no outcomes articulation or no focus on outcomes at all. So it's all output or digital factory, uh, feature factory and what is come for. So it's just um, two weeks uh, analysis, two week, um, two week analysis sprint followed by two week devs, followed by two week testing sprint, for example. Uh, DevOps barrier, yeah, so great. I see a lot of anti-pans. Um, is, uh, pat the anti patterns are powerful. Any any good news tonight? Any any folk <laughs> finding patterns that are going well in your in your context? Well, some folk focused on value. Excellent. Good. Really good to see. Agile only at the team level. Yeah, that's a common behaviour in many organisations. So some focused on value outcomes, others struggling to vertically slice properly to get that focus. <laughs> Give people their brain back. That's a nice pattern, not necessarily straightforward to do, but great to see happening. Community, that's awesome. So community of practice and um, yeah, that's, that's an awesome pattern. Yeah, anti-pattern there, this is the way it's been, disempowered. It's the way it's always gonna be, isn't it? Maybe not. Working with the business, that's wonderful to see, to get them to articulate their outcomes. Mm. Good start. And continuously trying to improve. Wonderful. I think that's quite a good place to pause on and come back to our presentation. Thanks very much, everyone. So that's an interesting glimpse into, into who you are. I'm going to pull back the slides at this stage and uh, hand over to John to connect into the, the um, patterns and anti-patterns from the book. Great, thank you. Thank you for your responses on that Menti survey. That was very interesting. Um, I'm going to give, or we rather, are going to give a quick overview of the main patterns and anti-patterns which are in the book. These are lessons learned the hard way. These are mistakes that we have personally made ourselves. We can vouch for these anti-patterns, having done all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so so the first one is uh, the first pattern is focus on the outcomes and this is why the book is called what it's called don't focus on agile for the sake of agile uh, we made this mistake back in 2015 we were running an agile transformation i was the head of the agile transformation and when i spoke to leadership teams the narrative on my slide effectively said hi my name is john and i'm here to make you do agile whether you like it or not any questions as you can imagine, uh, some people are like, hell yes. Other people are like, that's very interesting. Really meaning get the hell out of my office in a very English passive manner. They're like, oh, that's interesting. Meaning hell no. Um, so, uh, uh, so that was that. We were measuring the wrong thing. We were measuring how many, how many agile teams we have. You can have as many agile teams as you like. It doesn't mean that the outcomes are gonna get any better. Nokia Mobile found that with Symbian. It didn't save the Symbian operating system, even though they were doing large scale Scrum. I, we felt this firsthand, you know, um, after 12 months, we had all these teams who were doing agile, but the business outcomes weren't necessarily improving. And that's because we weren't breaking the impediments and we were focusing on the means to the end rather than the end. So the words that work 
are number one better better is quality this is uh, building quality in not inspecting it in later to quote deming inspecting quality in later is like saying um, i'll burn the toast and you scrape tell you what don't burn it in the first place um, the second one is value value is unique it's the reason you're in business you could be burberry and you could be making handbags and trench coats you could be rolls royce making jet engines you could be a bank with mortgages. It's entirely dependent on why you exist as a company. The next one is sooner, which is time to value, time to learning. The heart of agile and lean. It's how quickly can we learn? How quickly can we get the flow of value to the value consumer? The next one is safer. Safer is compliance. It's GDPR, information security. It's agile, not fragile. It's it's debunking a whole load of agile myths that, you know, oh, agile means we, we don't need to do any of this. We can just be cowboys. Nope. Um, the next one is happier and happier is customer colleagues, citizens and climate, because improving ways of working is not at any cost to society or to the planet. Um, I'm quite proud that I have never done an HR exercise as part of improving ways of working. I have never let anybody go. And it's quite it's quite interesting when you look at how many companies will do an HR exercise and then, oh, by the way, let's roll out Agile because we've just let 3000 people go. So we're going to use Agile as the excuse of like how we're going to, you know, get our productivity or delivery value of delivery back up again. But they've already let 3000 people go. Um, I don't agree with that. I, I think that everyone has a role and everyone can learn. In terms of the benefits that we've seen uh, for quality, 20 times improvement after three years across tens of thousands of people. That is 20 times less failure demand, 20 times less rework, 20 times less burnt toast. On Sooner, we saw on average a three times improvement on time to value, time to learning. That means three times less sunk cost fallacy. Again, this is at an organization that was 327 years old with 80,000 people. Um, the next one is 20 times improvement, and that was for the best performing teams. On compliance, we saw a reduced uh, trend in terms of compliance issues. We saw a reduced impact radius. So if something went wrong, it was a whimper rather than a bang. We saw colleagues spending 80% of their time proactively instead of reactively fighting fires for things that had already gone wrong. On Happier, with independent UView survey, we saw the happiest ever colleagues which for me is the most important thing. And we saw a positive trend in the client net promoter score. So it makes the world, as you, as you all know, it makes the world of work more humane. Yeah, and that, that floats my boat. You know, that's our purpose, to make the world of work more humane. Um, the next, on to the next one. So the anti-pattern is doing agile, doing DevOps, doing lean, doing digital, Capital A, capital T. The next pattern anti-pattern pair is achieve big through small, not big through big. This is applying an agile mindset to agility. Think big, start small, learn fast. You'll be surprised how many organizations apply a big bang approach to agile ways of working. So you leave on Friday, you're a project manager, you start on Monday, you're a product owner, whether you like it or not. Uh, S-curve adoption, don't try to do too much too soon. We made that mistake. We, we, we set a ridiculous target um, and you end up with cargo cult. You end up with new labels on the same behavior. You end up with fake agile. So you, the speed you go at is the speed of unlearning. The pace of change is the pace of unlearning. That's my unlearning and relearning. You cannot force the pace of change. The next one is invite over inflict, invite participation, don't inflict it. So the anti-pattern here is to inflict, pick a scaling framework of your choice across an organization. Hey everyone, you have to, you have to do Scrum, Safe, Less, Nexus, Scrum at Scale, whatever, whether you like it or not. Um, that is an anti-pattern, it's not motivating, it doesn't appeal to your internal motivation, you're not likely to be as successful because you're forcing it upon people. You've got rid of Dan Pink's autonomy, purpose and mastery in one fell swoop. Probably not a good idea. Um, so instead, one size does not fit all. 
minimal viable compliance, you know, so minimal viable guardrails, a small set of stuff which is not negotiable. Other than that, you use your own brains, dear colleagues, to figure out how to improve yourselves, aligned to better value, sooner, safer, happier. So that's that one. The next one is leadership behavior will make it or break it. Um, this one is quite binary. Um, you know, so you, you've got leadership support with psychological safety, servant leadership and role modeling, or you don't. If you have those things, you stand a chance because psychological safety means you can experiment, you can fail, you can fail safely. Um, bad news is not bad news. Bad news is learning. So news doesn't get buried. You know, theoretically bad news doesn't get buried like it normally does. It bubbles its way up. That is what killed Symbian at Nokia. According to the chairman of Nokia, whose book my microphone is resting on, he said that the demise of Symbian was a lack of psychological safety because bad news wasn't bubbling up, no matter how scrummy they were. Um, so that's that. Uh, number five is build the right thing. This is the pivot from project to product, from temporary teams, come together, disband, to long-lived products with long-lived teams and a focus on outcomes instead of milestones. So this is the pivot to OKRs, objectives and key results, a rolling roadmap with a focus on outcomes and value measures, not a milestone in the Gantt chart, which was put together 24 months ago, where the definition of success is, did you hit the milestone? I couldn't care less. That milestone is probably in the wrong place. Miles? Thanks, the next thing is building the thing right. So this is rethinking your governance, risk and control approaches. Um, this moves, moves you away from a situation where whatever speed your dev teams are going out when they hit the control gates, they all slow down to the same pace as everybody else. Uh, we put a stopwatch on a, a Hello World application and timed how long it took from code complete to in production. And for that, um, in, in that instance, in that context, we had three months elapsed time it took and 20 man days of project management effort and the reason this is is because your governance risk and compliance organization in a especially in a regulated context is heavily siloed uh, there are lots of people involved the effort required to engage with each of the different areas fill in their standard size approaches communicate with them what's needed understand the risks takes a long time. Instead, you're pivoting to a minimum viable compliance approach. This includes taking representatives from across all of your safety domains and asking them to work as cross-functional, long-lived safety teams paired with value streams where the relationship can build up, where greater context can develop, greater understanding of the business needs, greater understanding of the risk at play and, and a swifter communication and a, and a much leaner process for actually managing that risk. Simon, over to you. Thanks, Miles. Uh, next one, continuous attention to technical excellence, which the eagle-eyed among you will recognize as uh, part of one of the principles of the Agile Manifesto. This is effectively a sort of back to the future saying that uh, while, of course, you can apply agility and its principles to things beyond software, don't forget the software. Um, don't forget the principles that are in extreme programming. Don't forget to uh, keep an eye on entropy. Go slower to go faster. It's a bit contradictory, but uh, actually it isn't really. If you're just delivering feature, feature, feature and neglecting technical excellence, you will slow down. And so make sure that everything is balanced. Uh, make sure that you are delivering on paying off technical debt and learning new technical excellence in order to be able to sustain and probably increase the pace of change. Over and above that, uh, that's sort of team level practices, but practice technical excellence uh, at enterprise level. Um, so your enterprise architecture and your uh, team structures are uh, intimately intertwined. Follow the lessons from Mel Conway's observation in the late 60s and more recently that the team topologies guys are talking about. Make sure that uh, as you refactor your organization, uh, along uh, value stream analysis lines, make sure you are refactoring your architecture as well, because if you just reorganize against an old architecture, you're going to go slower, not faster. And finally, when you are 
doing a DevOps transformation or trying to look at introducing the tools that will help you. Remember that the, the focus is always on people. The tools are there to move drudge work, to move error prone work out of the way of smart, smart people and to let them deliver uh, better value, sooner, safer and happier. Thanks. Jolt. Thank you, Simon. So pattern eight or chapter eight is about the learning organization. Uh, one of the, the first uh, anti-pattern pattern pair is around information learning silos, um, information learning bubbles actually, disconnected <clears throat> information learning bubbles across the organization and the pivot from that to more connectedness, um, popping those bubbles, uh, uh, creating establishing collaboration platforms and conferences, internal mobility, ways of working awards, uh, and many other things listed in the book to, to create um, learning and sharing um, across the whole organization and connectedness. The other anti-pattern and pattern pair is around measuring. So weaponized metrics is the anti-pattern where um, the focus is on the target uh, to, to achieve a target um, instead of uh, maximizing learning and uh, focusing on outcomes. And, and from the, the pivot from that is the providing a self-serve dashboard to all colleagues at all levels um, to, to, to get data insights and correlations and, and being able to start measuring uh, better value, sooner, safer, happier outcomes um, and improving those based on measurements. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. So now Q&A. And we have time for discussion. Stop the share at this stage. Yeah. I think I'll open up the, the windows again. Yeah. So feel free to feel free to jump in with your any questions you have, any observations, reflections, challenges. Life coaching questions doesn't have to be on agile. Hi, John, I'll jump in here. Uh, Amy Led from PNC Bank. Uh, we've been following you for quite some time. So thank you for great inspiration on uh, business agility. And uh, one thing I, I think maybe we're having a challenge with or would love to hear from others as well is uh, the safety team notion and really building that physiological safety for everybody and really supporting all of those agile crews but yet still having a blanket of governance, you know, around there of just, uh, I feel like crews have made their own band-aids for the processes and the pains that they've been seeing. And in turn, obviously has become part of their process, but really having a hard time kickstarting them to say like, these crews are really there to help you. And it's not a slap on the wrist from risk audit compliance to say, no, you're doing a bad thing or like we want to be in this together so uh, just any kind of advice or, or things to kickstart to say to really kind of move past that thinking mm, miles so I, yeah sure i mean huge topic and an important area um within in my experience within the risk and control domains as within any uh, population of people you'll find innovators and early adopters and those that are slower to to come on board and so getting started um, you you kind of need to find someone who is interested some supportive folk um, at any level to, to start working with who are wanting to get a bit closer to the delivery teams because actually in order to manage manage the risk they have to be close to the delivery teams and you know, the data point i talked about for example of how long it takes to um, to navigate the risk and control gates, that kind of data point is, is quite a useful analysis to have done. Value stream mapping of the risk and control process surfaces useful data because it, it starts to create visibility of the cost. And obviously risk and control is super important and matters, but so does cost matter, so does time to the market matter. And so there's a balance which needs to be established. Actually, making those safety teams come to life 
is a cultural transformation for your risk and control functions. It's quite hard for them. They come from very different backgrounds and I probably wouldn't do um, exactly the thing that we did before, which is start with all of them at once. <laughs> um, I'd start smaller than that. And I'd start with the areas that have the biggest pain points. I mean, the most, for, in, in our context previously, the most logical ones to start with, if we were gonna start small again, would probably be IT security and enterprise architecture and IT operations, that they are the areas that have the most, um, they're the closest alignments to the technology folk who are delivering change into production when risk happens. And so asking those um, sort of areas to pair first may help, but in a client I'm working with at the moment, um, their IT security organization is already doing really well. Uh, they have other issues to do with um, financial um, uh, controls or a payments organization. And so they, they, need, they need finance involved at the table of the accountants to actually manage the, the process. And so getting them more closely aligned to value streams matters. So you kind of have to surface where the pain points are in the risk control environment. Value stream mapping, that process helps. And ultimately working with some of the early adopters in those populations to start small and agree to pilot. Um, some new ways of working. So, you know, we were working closely with our cloud team initially, the cloud platform team as an internal product. Cloud pr presents all kinds of new challenges from a cyber risk point of view um, and from all other opera ops point of views as well. So it's an area where innovation has to happen. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a recognition often that, that things really have to change. So you're know, finding those early areas where there's something really innovative going on and where the control teams are, are scratching their heads and wondering how to engage. And that can give you a way to start small with a, a small group of control folk and start to, to build out new patterns. But you can't seek to change the entire control process at mm -hmm. once. You know, the first the first change we made to our risk and control standards was you know, one clause, which um, added a clause that says some initiatives will be using a different <laughs> process than mm -hmm. the standard one defined here. And, and, and will be um, uh, you know, as a pilot exercise. And they, the risk and control teams were comfortable that providing that population was kept low and small to start with, um, you know, that was fine. Mm -hmm. so, so start small, get your cover through the standards and then keep improving as you go. And, okay. and just to add, just to add. Oh God, John, you, you do your Okay, just to, uh, uh, to just, just to add to what Miles said, um, it's all about people. It's 80% it's of this is culture and so I think it's about trying to trying to align to the flow of value, try and get that tribal identity to be the flow of value. So mm -hmm. we are all mortgages. We are all everyday banking. We are all savings. Because mm -hmm. I think, Amy, what I heard you say was they're still viewing, other people are viewing the safety team as kind of baddies, inflicting mm -hmm. things on them. So it, it takes time, but it's trying to get that we're all, we're one team. We're one team mm -hmm. together, all delivering mortgages or mm -hmm. savings i Thank agree you. and ju just to add to that i think uh, uh, on top of the sort of people focused view it's um go, go, go talk to them i mean fundamentally the, the the shift one of the reasons for the shift is there are no longer early gates in the process if you are not doing an upfront design if you're not doing an upfront analysis if you're delivering value continuously the only gate is production so go have the conversation you know say mm -hmm. hey remember in this old process when we used to have a big document for you to review and go away and sign off well we, we don't have one of those anymore what we do is we pick up something on a monday and by wednesday it's in production so you know how how do you want to engage if if that's if if that's gonna gonna happen? Here's a suggestion. Maybe you have others. Just a uh, follow up question uh, on on psychological safety and learning aspect because my and of course it's your experience probably as well is it's highly or tightly coupled with the organizational culture if that culture does not allow you to voice that, hey, something is wrong, then there are always going to be that something that will not bubble up as uh, one of you mentioned there. So how do I, as an agile coach, how do I tackle that issue? So that's one of the challenge that I feel that people are not honest enough to mm. say that, hey, we made a mistake and yeah. it's something that that's fine and then I want to learn from it. Yeah, a couple, a couple of thoughts on that, Anil. Um, the first one is with a charitable intent, there might not be an awareness that there's a lack of psychological safety. 
and sometimes mm -hmm. sometimes a bit and the same happens with with regulators and regulatory change and internal audit there's like oh we can't do that because of the regulation we can't do that because of audit or we can't do that because leaders won't let us sometimes it's almost self-fulfilling prophecy where mm -hmm. people project an image where actually there's never actually been a so then you say well did you speak to the regulators did you speak to audit or did you speak to that leader who you're saying is being command and control and the answer normally is no we didn't mm -hmm. well okay so then you're you're creating a persona i'm not suggesting you are Anil, by the way yeah quite it. often you know more times than not it's like well did you actually have the conversation so first of all have the conversation and I think especially if if in the context of you know, your question was as an agile coach, mm -hmm. so somebody has hired you or anyone else as an agile coach. Yeah. So there must be some desire for some agility. So, so start with whoever that sponsor is, you know, wherever the, the, the sponsorship for improving ways of working is. Um, and I guess the common sense answer is to have the conversation around, you know, it feels yeah. like this is a bit command and control around here. It feels like there's a culture of fear. Did you realize people are hiding, burying bad, you know, burying learning because mm. it's perceived to be bad news? Um, so one is to have a conversation. The other thing to do is to shine a light on it. Yeah. A great way to shine a light on it is surveys. So what I am a big fan of doing is roughly every quarter run a colleague survey. Mm -hmm. And in that colleague survey, you're asking questions like, do you feel psychologically safe? Do you feel you can uh, that intelligent failure is celebrated? Do you feel empowered? Do you feel incentivized? You know, do you feel you've got autonomy, purpose, and mastery, and so on? You get a bunch of results back. You ask a leadership team the same set of questions, and then look at the difference. Mm -hmm. Quite often, the leadership team rate themselves four out of five on everything, but their teams have rated them two out of five on everything. <laughs> It's like, right, leadership team, do you want to have a, you know, would you like to invite over inflict? Very, very important. Psychologically yeah. safe, invite over. Would you like to have a conversation on this? Mm -hmm. There have been leadership teams I've worked with where they've said, no, we don't want to. Yeah. Like, we know we have a problem. We're not ready to talk about it. Okay, see you later. I'll go and work somewhere else. <laughs> change oh. your employer or change your employer. Cheers. Thanks a lot for that. Another question? So, so sorry, Ines, go on. Uh, one of the things um, when I was uh, reading the book that my confirmation bias was like, oh, hell yeah. Um, it was around the OPEX and CAPEX nonsense. It has been driving me crazy for years. Why do we do this to ourselves? So in the mind, said shift in terms of how you organize your finances around value is there any kind of tips things that works well rounding the concept when you're having those conversations of okay we're going to look at these things differently how do you invite over inflict and you know a few things that you see in the arena because um, i tend to find that that is a it's a difficult one to to attack mm -hmm. maybe if i go first and then Others feel free to jump in as well. I think the so as you pivot to long lived teams on long lived products with the flow of value. Um, sorry, interesting comment, Helen, on the psychological safety. I just saw you in the chat. Um, so sorry, I'm just going to interrupt myself um, on Helen's comment. You did exactly that a couple of months back. The leadership team was shocked and wanted to change. Action was taken immediately. That's awesome. Yeah. High five. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, so back to the CFO point, we, um, slightly, slightly different, you know, very, very different here, psychological safety and the finances. Um, so on the, on the CapEx and the OpEx, um, what I find works with the CFO or finance people is you say, we're never going to overspend ever again, because we're going to capacity funded value streams. You know, we are treating the money as a constraint to maximize the value on. In the past, we've had projects they're always overspending because it's the fallacy of trying to predict the future. It's the gap of what's knowable and what's not knowable. So projects keep overspending. Dear CFO, guarantee no more overspends. 
because we're going to treat the money as a constraint. You know, there, there is no project. There are no projects anymore. There's a rolling roadmap of outcomes. That's number one. Number two is we will give you on a monthly basis a, a feedback loop on value. We will tell you what value we have realized every month. And that's the key result. That's the KR in OKR. So you've got your quarterly OKRs with a monthly cadence on them of, of you know, inspect and adapt and measuring the key results monthly or, or even more frequently. So every single CFO absolutely loves that message, which is, oh, my God, you're never going to overspend. And you're going to tell me every month what value I'm getting for the firm's financial investments. That's amazing. They love it. It's also quite hard to make the change, I think. So I'd say, yes, they love it, but also it's quite hard because the processes are kind of not supporting that today. So getting the, building the goodwill is, 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 is critical to start with and then kind of working through the details is the heavy lifting, isn't it? And I, I um, in, in principle, though, whenever I've done the, in, in the old way of working, you know, if you're thinking of a program of work, your, your starting points for figuring out what the cost of a program in old school might be, is you're going around the platforms the program's going to hit and you're asking for estimates from those people. So once you've constructed your logical value stream sketch, if you start to understand your slice your program budgets up by the value streams that they're impacting, you can actually translate your program budget into value stream budgets. You know what the value streams actually are spending today and you can come up with your prototype view of spend per value stream. And that's a good starting point for, for further conversations with, with finance or with the PMO. More questions. Just have a question. Maybe it's 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 about the book. Like, what was your writing process between four of you? How did it, it, it was a case it? of it was a case of me starting, realizing it was going to take me ten years to get it finished, and then making three phone calls to say, <laughs> "Please, could you help?" Right. Um, I don't know. Uh, Miles Schultz, Simon, do you want to add? I, I I haven't written you know a book before, so it was amazing experience actually. Um, what I would say is the process of writing um, is a great learning experience. It really forces you to um, straighten your thoughts, research carefully, and um, is is very rewarding. So um, a great experience. How we work together, you know, your it's, it's collaboration. I couldn't have done it without Google Docs. <laughs> No, but uh, we, we were we were working very closely. Yeah. yeah. Same for me. It was an awesome experience, um, and actually writing in uh, coffee shops and in places like together with Simon in Copenhagen, it was a, a awesome opportunity because I worked for a while in Copenhagen, so that was like a magical. Um, you know, what are the odds opportunities? So, and uh, he was there. He's still there. So he knew everything, uh, as always, he knows everything about where the best places in any city in the world. So if you want to get any recommendation where to go in South Africa, he's going to give you that. So, uh, so I ended up in awesome uh, restaurants and uh, you know, coffee shops with Simon. And yeah, it was, it was great collaboration, um, awesome experience. Yeah, just, just to echo everyone else, you know, interesting collaboration most of it most of it pre-covid um but still most of it remote most of the time i think the occasional uh coffee shop the occasional meeting in the royal festival hall in the sun which was fun um but yeah just just a fabulous collaborative effort although um incredibly waterfall <laughs> yeah it is very unagile it is very waterfall uh, it took two and a half years from starting to getting it published. Um, and just the book publishing process itself is, is very waterfall. There's, there is one COBOL mainframe at the center of book publishing. Mm. I kid you not. 
Everything that appears on the Amazon web pages goes through this COBOL mainframe. So uh, did you have a retrospective on your book writing? And if you did, what would you change for round two? Yeah, that's a good question. I think we can continuously retrospect, I think. Uh, the paperback version is coming out in October because um, the current one is, a, is hardback, as you, as you probably know, for those of you that have it. So there's a paperback version coming out in October. We've made some really minor tweaks to that. Um, so I think, I think retrospective, we, I mean, we, we all of us kind of spiked our chapters anyway. So if you, for me, if you look on medium.com, you'll see that I did a number of blog postings around about 2018, which all look remarkably like chapter one, two, and three. And that, so that was trying to take an agile approach by spiking the chapters using medium. Um, and I, I think we all did that to some degree to try to get early feedback. So um, no, I think the I think the only from a retrospective perspective, uh, it takes a lot of time. You know, if you've got a full time job as well, just forget having any kind of weekends or anything. Um, and yeah, and I think you know use use tools like Medium to get early feedback. Um, the other learning I think is it comes in three phases. Writing the book is only one third of the process. Mm -hmm. So writing it is one third, editing it is the second third, and then the promotion and publicity type activities is the other third. Yeah. Shouldn't the editing be done in an agile way as you oh, you'd, you'd think so, wouldn't you? <laughs> it, it's very waterfall in that it goes to the, to the publisher they do the the, edit, the editors at IT Revolution, Gene Kim's company. The editors are fantastic, but it then comes back to you. You've got two weeks. You've got a deadline. It's fixed. It's not negotiable. You, you make your edits in a PDF, annotate it. It's it's terrible behind the scenes. It's shocking. Um, there's there's loads of like manual you know duplication of effort, um, and then it goes back to the editors again. You get three rounds of two weeks to make your edits and that's it. I thought you were talking about editing each other's, you know, before you submitted it. I see, yeah, we did, it. Oh, yeah, no, I did that, yeah. I, I, I did a bit of wordsmithing to try and have a common voice across it. Yeah, correct. Um, interestingly, the third edit round was during the pandemic. So at points in the book, you'll say, you'll see it says, well, at the moment in the pandemic, <laughs> So that, that was the third edit round. It's quite nice to, to give that extra perspective. Mm. You know, yeah. Additional challenges that people are facing. Yeah, definitely. So I do have a, an, another question around sort of organizational um, change, I suppose. Um, we talk a lot about really big organizations and, you know, we've got Amy, we're talking about um, banking and then, you know, we often come and you go into organizations and they want to implement agile. Like you say, you've got some sort of deadline or whatever it is. How have you guys got experience of doing that in very small consultancies? Anyone else want to get that? I thought I got to choose. Over to Simon. <laughs> <laughs> in very small consultancies. Um, I've got experience of doing it, not at a very small consultancy, but doing it at a very small company, which mm -hmm. was a biotech startup. And what's fascinating around a startup is they can have the same level of dysfunction as a very large company. And they, they, they were, I think they were, they, they were at the scale of, they just got to a hundred people. And so they were still under the Dunbar number. They were still physically pre COVID on one floor in one building, but already there were like, there were silos, there was finger pointing. There was like, oh, you know, the designers are separate from the developers, the project managers were separate. They didn't know who was working on what. Um, so even in a small company, it's a, in my experience, it's the same types of dysfunction, if you like. 
That's really. I've, I've seen the same. Mm. I've seen the same in companies of less than ten people. You know, I think the the shift to think about outcome hypotheses is a shift. And if the um, leader doesn't think in terms of outcome hypotheses, then you're going to get this similar behavior. <laughs> you still get feature factory, even if you've only got two devs and, and one person trying to, to make it happen. So yeah, it's that is the interesting thing about this topic is whatever size of company you talk to and whatever industry they're in and whatever part of the world they're in, what we're actually dealing with is, is just human behavior and the same patterns seem remarkably consistent. John, John, you just, mentioned a couple of times, yeah, you know, that it's it's the culture and that you wouldn't get rid of anybody. And so is is the idea that regardless of how much of a culture shift it is for, you know, if it's 80% of the people or something, that that you just work on showing the individuals the value that's added, but it mm. Will take a long time rather than saying you need to be of a certain mindset to make this work. That, that's my system is that anybody can unlearn and relearn if they want to. And that's the invite over and flick point. And the, what I've learned the hard way is the word convince, the words convince and resistance shouldn't enter your vocabulary if you're going about change the right way. It's not about convincing anyone of anything. And it's only when you try to convince people that the word resistance pops up because you, you're trying to sell me something I'm not asking for. So it, again, you know, inviting participation means that the words convince and resistance shouldn't enter your vocabulary. So I don't try to convince anyone of anything. What I try to do is work out from their selfish gene, what problems do they have? So typically just get, just ask the question, how's it going? <laughs> and most humans, most people, will go, oh, great, thanks. But once you get past the great thanks, then you get the, well, actually, you know, this is not so good and this is not so good and this is not so good. So I normally start out, when I'm starting with an organization, I will ask the question, why change? Just why change? Yeah, I don't, I don't mention Agile or Lean or DevOps or digital. Just, just, and if the answer is, and I, say, and I actually very explicitly say, it's fine to say we don't need to change. That's a legitimate answer. And it, I have never, ever had anybody say, we don't need to change. People come up with answers like, we're too slow, we're too inefficient, you know, we've got too high attrition, um, you know, we, left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing, and then, and then come at it from what problems do people have. So, like, oh, okay, I've got a couple of tricks up my sleeve that I think can help with that one. Um, and on the culture point, if you've got command and control, you know, um, uh, Ron Westrom, uh, Westrom uh, cultural typology. You've got pathological cultures, you've got bureaucratic cultures, and you've got generative cultures. If you have a pathological culture, it's typically, you know, the shadow of the most senior leader. You know, the most senior leader casts the biggest cultural shadow. If you have a pathological organization, there's not a lot you can do about it. You know, back to the change your organization or change your organization, you know, and to the invite point. If there's no invitation and it's a pathological culture, see you later. You know, I have the lu personal luxury of being able to choose to work for another company. Um, however, if there's some people in the organization who are saying, we, you know, actually, you know what, we really, I, I've got an open mindset, a growth mindset. I really want to try something new. Great. We get behind that person. Um, there are some who do, and then, you know, someone who has said to me repeatedly, this is the way I work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't right. suggest any changes. This is the yeah, way I work. Yeah. And on that one, so I think the diffusion of innovation curve, Everett Rogers, 1962, you've got innovators on the left, early majority, um, early adopters, early majority, late majority and laggards. My learning on this is don't put any energy behind the laggards. Don't try to convince anyone of anything. Leave them be. Put all of your energy behind the champions, the believers, the people who want to try something. Generate social proof in your context. So prove it. Start showing and telling and communicating that social proof. The people sitting on the fence will come off the fence and they'll become champions. The critics will start sitting on the fence over time. Takes time. And what I found is when we got, so this took us three and a half years, but when we got into the laggards, what I found is 
they didn't like being the odd ones out. So there was this mad rush at the, at the end. There was this mad rush. There isn't an end. But what I observed was this mad rush of like, oh, quick, we're in. Because the innovators like to be the odd ones out, the ones on the left-hand side. They like to be unusual. But the laggards really like to be in the herd. And then so this, it tipped, basically. We got to that point and it was like, right, next year, we're all in. Long live products, long live teams. That's really, really good advice really interesting and i have in certain cases just kind of left it yeah have a better working relationship work on other people. leave and be yeah. where i can make a difference make if you want my help i'm here if you don't fine yeah, yeah. um yeah. well there's something else that i was going to i'll think of it in a minute i think on that point it's uh, quite interesting how especially the ones working in tech we have the concept embedded for us, right? So we'll have a pilot, we'll have something that we want to test, we'll do AV plus control group. Um, and then in terms of ado adoption, you know, how are we gonna structure so that we have users that try it first, become champions. Um, but the correlation of trying to do it with other things is like missing. I just find that um, mm. interesting how, yeah. Yeah. Start small, yeah, A-B testing, start small, start with smaller groups. Um, and also there's a risk for, for any of you who are agile coaches, you know, there's a risk of coming across as a zealot. It, you know, it's alienating if, you, if individuals come across as agile is the answer, what's the question? It's like, no, I, didn't, I don't want agile. I want better outcomes. I want bet more value quicker, but I don't want scrum or safe. So I think it's almost like not mentioning the A word um, is, is part of it as well. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, that is how I actually I came across your work like a few years ago, where I stopped defining agile and I start talking about delivering better value, do that yeah. sooner, safer, and happier. Great. There you go. Awesome. So any other questions or uh, I'm not sure what time we were due to finish. Yeah, I was going to say we have uh, yeah, just a couple more questions. If, if anybody has any burning questions and either put it in the chat or I'll throw Thank another you. one uh, in the meantime. Well, uh, you lot think of, of the last one. So you mentioned that the book has been taking quite some time to get out now in the terms of the pandemic. Um, you, you mentioned the Unconcord a few times during the book, right? And, and um, I think the pandemic itself is, is one that has stopped us and paused us and made us think, actually, let's hold for a second. Where do we want to go? So what is your perspective on that? I'm asking for a view um, on how the change is affecting the age of digital or where we're going, what the difference, it can be the same. Um, I'm not going back, I'm going forward. So what's your take? So I think in the pandemic, we saw um, every organization I speak to said, said that we were at our best at the beginning of the pandemic. People came together, rallied around, clear mission, high alignment, you know, forget your role-based silos. We were amazing. Without exception, every company I have spoken to says that, and it's true. So the, the conversation then is, how do we bottle up that, you know, what we were capable of doing at the beginning of the pandemic and make it the, norm, the new normal? The answer to that question is high alignment, you know, clear outcomes to achieve, um, multidisciplinary working together, autonomy, not having to fill out 45 mandatory artifacts. You know, I imagine at the beginning of the pandemic, people were cutting corners on the governance. One, one true story, um, one financial services organization had their call centers working from home within, I think it was, was it three days or three weeks? I can't remember, Jolt. Um, but but one, one well-known building society had their call center working from home in either three days or three weeks, where previously, the COO was being told it would take four years. Yeah. That just shows what, you know. We have similar things. Yeah. Barclays, yeah. Yeah. I think it's, um, the, the other angle is, I think it's super exciting though, because, and that we just had a discussion at the building society about that, what's, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen after it all ends and they're back to no, new normal? 
because if you think about that, that was there was no choice. So previously, our life has been uh, office only, or the majority was office only. I, I never worked from home. I wasn't the type. And then now it's home only, right? So it's like a two extreme. It's like one bit, one bit. And now it's going to be a, a, a huge amount of different options available than either home or, or like mix of home and office. So then, then it's going to be super interesting what behavior patterns we're going to see. Um, and then as, as, as John mentioned, high alignment comes and all those things, uh, value streams, multidisciplines are going to help. But I think organizations are going to have all kinds of different results when it's going to be a mix of, of, of home and, home and um, office. It's going to be super exciting. One of the things I was going to say um, about that scenario where at the beginning of the pandemic, everybody pulled together. Oh, sorry, my iPhone <laughs> phone is... Um, that there was one goal. Right, there was a common goal. It was the priority goal: get everybody up and running. You know, get the soft, get the software out there, get the hardware out there. You know, make it happen because we have to do this to keep our business going. When we're not in that sort of scenario, every different business unit leader, whatever, they all have their own priorities, and then they get conflicting, and they want the same resources. So, you know, it was that kind of set your goal, set your priorities, and deliver everybody at the same goal. Yeah, so yeah, there was nothing else getting in the way because that was just too high yeah. of a priority to- Yeah, and this is, I'm seeing, I'm seeing a high, there's a high level of interest at the moment for exactly that, you know, trying to replicate that. And the way I see that manifesting itself is the combination of value stream alignment. So organizations pivoting from role-based silos to multidisciplinary teams aligned by value number one secondly the adoption of okrs so objectives and key results it, you know you intersect with the value stream that gives you uh, when you do it well it gives you the high alignment so basically it's it's goal setting here's your goal here's your here's the mission and here's our multidisciplinary team we have all the skills we need to get it done without handing anything off to anyone and that's if you get to that point, that's where you can start to get some of that magic um, around the not the output, not the milestone in the Gantt chart, but the outcome. The outcome is we've got happier customers. You know, we've we've enabled more first time buyers on the property ladder um, and we are product pricing, marketing, sales, IT and operations together. So I think that's the there's a real like um, there's a real high demand for organizations, you know, moving in that direction. OKRs, just a little interesting point on this, the DevOps Enterprise Summit last week, highly recommend if you've not been to it. Out of the top four most watched talks, three of them were on OKRs. A uh, quick question from me. Um, just wondering if you had any strong opinions on co-located um, scrum teams. Hi, John. Hi. How are you? I'm good. It's been about 20 years. It's been a while. Yeah, uh, <laughs> has it been 20 years now? Uh, I yeah, can't no, remember. Not 20. I, I don't think it's been quite. <laughs> I think it was Royal Mint Court, I think. I, yeah, I think maybe I had less grey hairs on my beard then. <laughs> well, I'm, sure I had I had, less, I'm not less, even sure I had a beard then. I think I had less grey hair. <laughs> maybe that's where I recognise you from, John. <laughs> Yeah. Is this a Robin Court reunion? Excellent. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> nice. Um, so, um, what was your question, John? Yeah, so I, I was just wondering if you had any strong opinions on Agile teams being co-located. So I've, I've kind of had experience of oh, both right. working across, you know, across teams across the Atlantic and, and teams that then became kind of... Uh, near short basically yeah my 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 personal view on this is same time zone yeah like yeah. there is there is no such thing as physically co-located anymore same time zone so as long as you as long as you don't have like you know a one hour window where you overlap you know which kills communication so same time zone would be my view 
and then so, a, a product, sometimes a product owner bridge. I PO to PO. Sorry, Simon. Would, sorry. <laughs> um, controversially, uh, it's most of the time it is not possible. However, the statement in the Agile Manifesto still holds true. The most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within the development team is face-to-face -face conversation. It is. Most of the time, you will not be able to do that. If you can have a two pizza-sized team physically co-located, it will be zero doubt, zero argument. It will be more efficient. However, very unlikely you can get that these days. Yeah. That, that, well, that was my last experience. Co-located two pizza yeah. team, but before that, had the same organisation. We had most of the team, apart from the product, a couple of product owners that were actually based in the US, as opposed yeah. to the UK. You, you, you will always, always lose something in the comms. Yeah. And the other piece of advice, and there's a superb Martin Fowler article about this, is if you're going to be remote, don't do half remote. Don't have like three people sitting together, and then others not. You've got to go all the way. You've got to have everybody equally uh, represented and using the same tools and not have side conversations because then you'll create half a team. Yeah, this, there seems to be a, a, a real kind of uh, surge of opinion at the moment of people wanting to work from home. And I'm, I was kind of, kind of yeah. just concerned that exactly how is that going to work for Agile if, if everyone's not co-located, half the team's working from home, half the team isn't. It just sounds it, like it, it might it, be again, a bit of a disaster. Half, half. If everybody's working in the office, then they have to use the remote tools when they're communicating permanently. Um, there are superb examples of extremely high-performing Agile teams. Um, Rachel Davis, who is one of the original Extreme programmers, is working for Times Educational Supplement with uh, a good friend of mine in the UK right now. That team is 100% remote and they are an extremely high-performing Agile team. It's absolutely possible, for sure it is. We may be a little bit biased here at Virtual Agile, <laughs> but it's always good to have lots of different opinions and experiences, certainly, of how we're all going to inspect and adapt for, I guess, the future, right? Like, who knows where we're going to be going um, in the next few years. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, we are at 45 minutes to now. Um, it would, yeah, it's, it's been really great to have you guys on board and sharing so much um, knowledge and talking about uh, Sooner Safer Happier as well. So thank you so much to spend that time with us. Um, we are going to have to wrap it up though. Um, so we do appreciate your time. Oh, no other burning questions as of right now. I, I would kind of put out some burning questions, but I feel like mine are always kind of nitpicks of a, a bigger, you know, <laughs> problem uh, or opportunity. Uh, just on forming product teams, right? I, I think when we did a transformation, we focused a lot on that cultural mindset, instilling the roles, building up those ceremonies, having a cohesive team. So now we're really realizing the product end to end, bringing those under a portfolio, having those high functional um, capabilities around that. Uh, but the it, it probably goes into Miles, what you're talking about that pilot or prototype thing is um, now that we go to our uh, our next evolution or Agile 2.0 or call it whatever, right? We're building that uh, product taxonomy in the bank and trying to do the similar value stream mappings right over, you know, bankers and tellers or mortgage, right? The same theme. Um, any pieces of advice as we go to that? Because now I think more of the business is like, oh, I thought you told us we're agile, we're agile now. Why are you trying to change my teams? Is kind of, you know, what, what, uh, what benefit does the product teams have? And then conceptually getting those leaders to understand the end-to-end -end or building around that, I would say is lagging. I think, um, part, sorry. Shall I, go? Um, but I think part of the conversation here is, is around continuous improvement. So it's the, one of the responses you mentioned, you know, we're agile or not, it's, it's not about being agile or not, mm -hmm. it's about continually improving. So that's what you're trying to do, mm -hmm. which is great. And um, second thought is, 
a product taxonomy is a great thing to have. It's an important step to go through. The word product can be super confusing for people in my experience. Mm -hmm. Does it relate to the thing that's sold or does it relate to some sort of traditional product owner type thing? Or does it relate to the software elements that you buy off the street? You know, what's a product? And so people can get quite confused. So having some clarity around what you mean and intend by that is, is helpful. Um, but also I wouldn't sweat going through some great big upfront definition of all the products um, mm -hmm. and, and get it signed off before you do anything because <laughs> actually what you're you can certainly have a sketch of what you believe the product taxonomy might be and then start with one try and make make the improvements start working in that place mm -hmm. and try and work with your most enthusiastic um, uh, colleagues in you know in, in one of one area one or two areas and and then the the you know the the real skill i believe as coaches then is to create a platform for those people to share their learnings with with others and, and so for that information and knowledge to spread and so trying to um, foster the right sort of communities and, and events and moments and um, whatever format you you choose um, for, for, for information sharing and that's obviously what joel talks about as a, as a learning organization um, so that would be my some of my thoughts okay. Thank you. Yeah. And I think just, just, just to add in terms of branding, you know, it's never agile 2.0, agile is never done, be agile about agile. Having done this in one part of a previous organization I worked at where their agile 1.0 had sort of not worked and then they'd done an agile 2.0 and that sort of not worked. And we went and we said, hey, here's some principles, let's experiment. And they said, oh, this sounds like agile 3.0. And we said, no, this is Agile 0.1 Alpha, and it will continue to be 0.1 Alpha because you're going to learn, you're going to experiment. This is never done. And that really is the sort of branding you need to take to any mm -hmm. not Agile, not transformation. Thank you. Okay. Um, Amy, if feel free to connect on LinkedIn, you know, if you want to have a follow on conversation, happy to do that. Okay, great. Thanks. Wonderful. Um, yeah, I've certainly got a few, um, few takeaways. One of my favorites is uh, pace of change is not pace of unlearning. I quite like that snippet, snippet of gold um, asking, how are you? And I guess actually listening and feeding back <laughs> helps, which is always uh, always helpful. Um, and also bringing clarity around the product. I think, Miles, you were just talking about that. It's so obvious and so simple, but yet, well, simple, not simple. Um, but but yeah, it's such a such a great point. So thank you again um, for coming and spending your time with us. Um, Simon, Zolt, Miles, John, it's been a real pleasure to be able to have this time with you. Um, and yes. Can I say one more thing? Sorry, I just remembered that you triggered something in my memory, Helen. When, Go for it. Um, and, and John, you were kind of a, talking about, um, you know, don't put something down somebody's throat and, you know, bring them along and whatever. And I read something recently about influencing and all the influencing skills that it talked about. It was really interesting. It was listening and mm learning and you know there were about a dozen things that were none of them were about telling or yeah you know they were about um role, being a role model showing uh, listening you know collaborating yeah. and um you know i was even kind of addressing myself thinking well i'm sure i do influence people but i i, I didn't you know i don't go in and kind of tell some people what to do and whatever and, and it was that that made me realize that's how I do it. I do it by being, you know, not not really coaching, but being part of that team, listening. What you know, what ideas do you have? How can we make this happen? How can we add value? Yeah. How, you know. Yeah. I, I just found it really interesting, and I thought finally the light went on. You know. Yeah. The light went on. It, what I actually do, because. Yeah, yeah. Kind of yeah, like, that's great. That's great. Uh, strongly agree. It's about asking the right questions. Mm. And so when I'm in, when I'm coaching leadership teams or leaders on this topic who are, you know, alien to modern ways of working, um, it's just me asking questions. 
I don't, I don't, I don't say anything other than ask questions. But it's like, oh, and, the, and it's quite interesting how people will say, oh, that was, that was a great session. But I didn't, I didn't tell you anything. <laughs> no, all I did was ask you questions. And, you know, and it's, but it's asking the right questions, and I think, and kind of where you hone in, and, mm. um, and then, and then subsequently, it then turns into right. Well, here's, you know, here's some, gu- here's some guidance. Now I understand your selfish gene. Now I understand where you're coming from and your problems. Here are some solutions, yeah. you know, not using the A word necessarily. Thank you. Clean language. So yeah. Just in the just, chat. <laughs> yeah, just that there, if you want to go to the extreme in that, how to listen, the clean language and clean coaching or gestalt coaching. Mm. Those, those are really good topics to dive into. Yeah. That's great. Thanks for sharing those tips. Okay. Do I dare clo- try and close the session? Any last questions? <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, guys. And uh, enjoy the rest of your evening and the rest of your week. And my goodness, happy bank holiday weekend if you are in the UK or anywhere else that US. has the US. US. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so thank you. you. Sorry, I don't think Germany has it, do they? So. Had it last week. Or Copenhagen. Copenhagen, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Copenhagen, yeah. We, we yeah, had sorry. one this week as, as well. well. Okay. <laughs> mm, it's, good. it's all good. Great. Great. Thank, you holidays. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.